conversation with Jason Beal. We talk about regulation and the direction of management technologies into the future. This is a bonus episode of The Business of Tech. Yeah, we've known one another a long time. So, you know, I think it dates back to my MSP days and you two or three business rolls back. But for those that may not know, what what are you up to now? Uh, so still based in Southern California. I've been back in uh, the United States for three years after spending about eight years in Europe. And I'm the Senior Vice President of Global Channels and Partner Ecosystems for AvPoint. Yeah, I've been here about a year now and uh, helping the company you know, re-architect its go-to-market and pivoting hard towards you know, indirect and partner co-selling. Gotcha. So I want to kind of wander through two areas that I think you've been thinking about and get your take on these. And the first is, is, is that I want to give you an opportunity to kind of weigh on some of the things that we're seeing in regulation. There's a bunch of stuff moving through Congress right now, right? Like there's there's a bunch of different bills and they have things around disclosure or they've got things around uh, the way remediation vulnerabilities should work and definitions of managed services, like all of these things. What's your take on some of these bills that are moving through or the or the bills as a general trend? I mean, I think that the leadership from the federal government is is critical. It's, it's helpful. A lot of this is, um, addresses... You know, problems that the industry itself has been trying to to solve for for decades, and the arguments right that we've been making to uh, businesses, universities, governments for a long time. But the leadership from the federal government, with the five different cybersecurity bills passed through the House in July, um, provides tremendous support. And by the way, provides a lot of funding. Right. So there's a, for instance, this the state and local cybersecurity improvement act. It's $500 million grant, right, for state, local businesses to help erect their, their digital barriers to cyber attacks. A lot of it is, is leadership around, um, you know, the critical infrastructure and departments of energy. So leadership, putting us at the forefront, putting attention to it is always helpful. And um, I also think back to, what was it, a couple months ago in June where, the Biden administration had put out a memo. And again, it was, these are things, Dave, that, you know, you and I and our, all of our friends in the industry have been working on for a long time, right? They gave these five best practices around backing up your data offline and patching systems properly and doing pen testing and having instant response systems and segmenting networks. We've all been doing those and advocating those things, but again, Leadership from the federal government, documentation, communication is only going to help compel businesses and, and universities and the government itself to, to pay more attention and, and to spend more. We've been serving regulated industries, but are we moving towards being a regulated industry ourselves formally? Is that where you think this is going and what does that mean for us? I think certainly there will be more uh, um, formal and uh, accountabilities for the IT providers, be them an ISV like an AppPoint um, and the, let's say the quality, right, of our, of our software and of our code, right? We, we, we can think without naming names back to just a few recent examples where the ISVs themselves have, have that vulnerabilities exposed and then have unfortunately impacted their partners and their clients. Certainly service providers and cloud service providers, I think will have more um, accountability, more formal accountabilities on the, the delivery of their technology down to the end customer. And then, yeah, either through, you know, with managed service providers, either, either through their, their, their contractual agreements with their end customers, whether it's, you know, their responsibilities for um, things like cyber in, insurance, um, whether it's their responsibilities under GDPR to provide quote unquote uh, state of the art technology and to make quote unquote best efforts right to protect uh, customer data and privacy, I think yeah, I'm, more and more of the industry itself will have more formal accountabilities. Yeah, and and you're I mean you're exactly right, and, and I don't think it's necessary to name names because. It's almost interchangeable. Like that, the, the fact that it have, several have happened profile, high profile in the IT community, the name is a little less relevant because 
I could swap that out, right? It, it was just they were the ones that got hit. Yes. Yeah. That's the not the important detail. The important detail is is that the the risk of those channels. So as an ISV, how much do you think about where the responsibility for risk management, like what is your portion of that supply chain risk versus what the provider does? Because it's not 100% on either side. It's not all them, it's not all you. Yeah. What's the bit that you think the ISV needs to own and be you know, world-class at doing? Probably two, two parts to the, you know, to answer that question. One is just this, you've heard the term, the shared security responsibility models, whether it's, you know, public cloud shared security responsibility model, or whether it's a shared security responsibility that, that Microsoft itself has for, you know, its platform and its product. An ISV like AppPoint is the same, right? Kind of, we're going to be responsible for the quality of the application, some of the plumbing, some of the hosting of it, the SaaS environments, the redundancy, the data center. And then our downstream constituents, be them the partners or the end users, will also have certain responsibilities for the application, it, it, how they're using it, the governance, the, the you know backing it up, policies, permissions, data loss. So there will certainly be a, a shared responsibility and then I think secondly, like in the industry, because we're in the industry, we even have more of a responsibility to protect our reputations so that we're not being breached, right? So, you, you know, whether you're a cybersecurity company, boy, you better not be hacked. If we're a company that's doing data management and backup, boy, we better not lose the data or make it unmanageable. So I think in, in, in both respects, the, we, we, we have to pay attention. So I want to let me offer a, a premise then, um, and let, let's do this. This is a little bit more forward thinking in terms of the way that the market might be going. I think technology management of the future is around policy compliance when accessing cloud resources. I think that that's the that's the way the model is going away from the idea of much more endpoint focused management to this idea of making sure that the business sets what's allowed, particularly access to data and the IT systems enforce that rather than a try and control everything approach. Yeah. What's your take yeah. on that premise? So you're right, because organizations are, they're, we're struggling to find this balance between cybersecurity, cyber resilience, and then end user productivity and agility and access to all that information and data in this digital world, right? So how do you strike that balance? How do you empower at the same time protect? I, I, I always have these kind of two mental images, right, where I like to describe when we talk around this, this cyber resilience is if we look at kind of the classic GRC, governance, risk, and compliance side of the house, right, then you conjure up mental mnemonics of, you know, people with, you know, clipboards and, and big filing cabinets and kind of that old kind of records management and paper and heavy on audit side of the house that really was never driven out of IT and certainly never like a historical part of the MSSP or MSP business model. But GRC was critical, but again, think paper and records and audit. And then on the other side, you had a lot of MSPs that grew up in that universe where you talked about desktop management, server management, network, some, you know, some applications and eventually SaaS applications. Well, certainly today we are seeing this convergence of those two sides of the house, right? You're seeing GRC be much more an application and IT driven um, challenge. And you're seeing MSPs now take on more and more of this opportunity, this responsibility around governance, right? If you would have asked an MSP 10 years ago or asked 100 MSPs, how, much, how many of you do like governance? and user policies and permissions and, and compliance and risk management, maybe there have been less than 10%. Well, they've been now pulled into this world because it's now a key part of an overall cyber resilience or cyber security strategy. So the coming together of these two worlds is putting more of a more of an onus on the managed service providers to do that, to do governance, to do compliance and, um, and help their customers in that way. So you're talking to a lot of partners and you're thinking a lot about this, this IT cloud management control and protection space. 
what are the list of requirements you've identified that are kind of the, the important bits for IT providers in this cloud management and control space? So similar to kind of historically where you're looking at when you're helping a, a business look it up your upstream and your downstream constituents and what access that they may need to your systems and data and making sure that you can provide the right level of access for external constituents in order to help um, you know, service your and expand your, your market. I think that at the same time, it's we have to look then also at what is your specific industry or vertical market? Because there are a myriad of different compliance and regulatory requirements for individual industries. And there too, managed service providers work with their customers to understand what those requirements are and then to address those. And then I think the third vector would be around geography, right? I.e., the kind of individual country or um, region requirements, um, where they are in the world, for which uh, governments you know they're governed by, and there's there also will be a new host of, of challenges and requirements that the uh, IT providers and the MSPs will need to address. So I think those three vectors. Well, are are critical when when trying to help a an end customer with their um, cloud management and cloud access and cybersecurity strategies. Gotcha. So then I'm going to ask you to to play investor for a second, right? So so you've got you've been asked by an investment group uh, to go build an IT services company, and as a guy who's who spent a lot of time thinking about this, what would you build? What would it look like? You know, I still, still firmly uh, value and believe in that role of the local trusted advisor, right? As much as that, as we've talked about that term in the last few decades, and as sophisticated as technology is, and being able to do remote delivery and having data centers all around the world, and all, I still believe in that local trusted advisor working with the the business understanding what what they need to do, providing a technology roadmap, providing consultancy services, implementation. So I, I would start from there. Businesses, schools, governments still have needs. They still are not gonna be the experts. Technology is incredibly complex. It needs, you need to be incredibly specialized and have incredibly competent you know, human resources to help your customers solve IT challenges. So I would start there. Then second is that more and more when I talk to partners, there is this business model that's created around this, what they call this total ecosystem economic opportunity, more so than the resale of the technology, either hardware or software. In fact, Dave, I talk to many partners now who will say we're non-transactional. I'll say, what does that mean? We're non-transactional. We don't want to resell even a, a software license, let alone a piece of hardware. But our business model is around the technology. How do we co-create IP? How do we provide managed services, professional services, consulting services? How do we drive you know, integration? So that business model where you're not dependent on any particular vendor's partner program or what the discount is that they're offering or what the list price of something is, but I'm going to create a lot of value around the technology is something that I would have in mind if I was going to be pitching an MSP uh, or pitching an investor to start up an, an MSP business. I love I love that answer, by the way, like it, because it, your thinking and mine are a lot alike. I'm going to ask a little bit specific, like, does that look a lot like a consulting business? Is the because the, it sounds like the main thing you're pitching is the advice is the product, right? The guidance is the product. Is that a consulting business that you're that you're proposing? It's a part of consulting. So uh, you you need to earn right the 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 trust, the respect, the the loyalty of an end customer through the the consultancy, your expertise, again, that human capital. But as we know, consultants and businesses, a lot of professional service businesses just aren't scalable, right? Your ability to scale is directly tied in many cases to labor hours, right? And so I, if I start a business, I'm always looking at destination planning, right? Where, where do we want to take the business? And how do you increase a multiple? 
you're not going to get the highest multiple from consulting, from, from one-time services revenue. For a while, the holy grail was to try to get the entire business towards monthly recurring. I think in practicality, certainly we've seen this with, with partners at, at, at AbPoint. We've talked to many of my peers. And there's this, this hybrid model where a large portion, 40 to 60%, can be monthly recurring. But you don't want to walk away from opportunities. In our case, migration is a one-time service. And you want to help customers through migration, make sure they're doing all the proper planning, due diligence, use it right. One-time project, take the one-time project. Have a great monthly recurring. If you're going to have vendors that are going to help give you uh, influencer fees and referral fees, take them, right? You want to have... So there's just... Nowadays, partners need to be agile, create monthly recurring revenue, but find other ways, again, to monetize what you do well. Um, and ultimately, that can drive the right multiple. Gotcha. Okay, that, make, that makes a ton of sense. So last question then, as we're, we're recording this, kind of coming up on the U.S. Thanksgiving holiday, we're, we're thinking about next year. As you look to 2022, what are you on the lookout for? What's the big thing that you think is, is kind of a prediction or a direction for, for next year? You know, managed service providers have, a need, have an opportunity, but there's an immediate need, right, for them to work with their um, their customers on kind of not what we call not just backing up, but buttoning up these um, digital collaboration environments. So this, I, I load the sound like an AppPoint commercial and talk about our digital collaboration platform, but feedback that we're getting from partner conversations, from survey data, is that in this rush to move employees, students, government workers onto these collaborations to, uh, applications during COVID, get the employees and students you know, productive again, we jumped, right? We missed some of that proper you know, due diligence, planning, user training, user guides, and they're on and uh-oh, they're vulnerable. We, we, we keep hearing that we went back in now to our end customer environments and there's vulnerability. We need to, we need to button these things up. So I think that's an opportunity on 2022. We've, we, we've kind of gotten through the storm here. Businesses are back up and running. Students are either online or in person again. Now let's go back and do that proper uh, amount of, of you know, governance work and user policies and admins and records management and data classifications and all. Let's do all that stuff again now to make sure that we're reducing the number of, of vulnerabilities and protecting against ransomware and, and uh, you know, other cyber attacks. Gotcha. Well, that'll give us something to work on for next year. Jason, thanks for joining me today. Dave, again, thanks for having me. It's been fun. When it comes to delivering cybersecurity services to your clients, there's a lot to consider and even more at stake. Firewalls and antivirus don't provide enough protection anymore, and adding more tools to an already complicated tech stack is expensive and difficult to manage. The Field Effect Partner Momentum Program, together with their award-winning security portfolio, solves these issues by making it easier for MSPs to deliver complete cybersecurity protection, unlock new revenue streams, simplify operations, and stand out from the competition. Learn more and connect with the Field Effect team today by visiting fieldeffect.com slash MSP Radio. Thanks for listening to this bonus episode of the Business of Tech. Like it? Hit the like button and hit that big subscribe button. It really does make a difference, and I appreciate you taking the time to listen to what I'm doing. You want to discuss more? Want to find out more about the interview? Go ahead and put something in the comment. I read them all, and I look forward to the ongoing discussion. If you want to get content like this every single day, the 5-Minute Business of Tech podcast is available wherever fine podcasts are found. Go to businessof.tech, click the big blue subscribe button. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Additionally, if you want to help me with the content I create, you can support me directly. Go to patreon.com slash mspradio and click the button there. You choose what the content is worth and get access to these interviews and discussion episodes early. They come out for my Patreons early and Patreons drive the discussion 
and ask questions directly. I'm looking forward to ongoing conversations. Thanks for watching. Thank <laughs> you.